Hey everybody, it's Dr. Mary Gardner uh, from Lap of Love, and I have a super special guest for this Facebook Live, one of my veterinary idols, <laughs> uh, Dr. Mike Petty. Hi, Mike. Dr. Hi. Mike. So um, I am just such a fangirl of yours and uh, have been for probably over six years. Thanks. And <laughs> have stalked you at many of the vet conferences. <laughs> but not in a and, weird way. Not in but, a, weird. <laughs> a little a little weird sometimes. But all in it all in a good in a good way. And um, it is because you are what I consider the guru, the master of pain. <laughs> and I don't know if that's a good thing to say. So Mike, you are you are in Michigan, correct? Correct. Correct. I practice in a suburb of Detroit. Nice. And is it it's probably cold there already, right? You know what? It's unusual weather for November. We're hitting 70 degree weather this week. So, which never happens, but which you know. Never we'll take that's it. That's perfect. I'm here in Florida and and it's hot and humid still. But you tell me why tell me like why you're the pain guru like what make what gives you the cred because you've got some cred behind you yeah I, you know i i've always been interested in pain management and I, you know it all started when i i was in high school i worked for this clinic that did things like you know they use morphine and ketamine and local blocks and so forth and then i went to veterinary school and we're talking like you know stone age so i started veterinary school in the late 70s and uh they didn't do anything like that there you know they would give morphine to their orthopedic surgeries and that was it yeah. and i've always known there's there's a better way and so it's always been a passion of mine to kind of go back to the the roots of what i learned when i was in high school <laughs> observing and um i have always embraced every new bit of pain management that I could, both acute and chronic. So here's here's the problem, is mm. that with pain management, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? It's like, wow, so I can do this, but I can't do that. And so I've I've really pursued a lot of things like, you know, acupuncture and rehab. I've mm. I've studied on the human side of, of pain management. I've done a lot of stuff. And I, you know, I and <laughs> Not to sell myself short, but I feel almost like, you know, I, I, I realize now how little every time I learn something new, I, I really learn how little I know. There's just so <laughs> much to learn about pain management. And it's an exciting field. And it's made a lot of progress, especially in the last 10 years. For sure. Now, um, you were like the president of some big association for veterinarians. And the, pain, the, right? the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. Yes, I was the president. President elect, president, and then past president for a six year span. Oh my gosh. So that is just an organization to learn everything about pain, up to date techniques, things like that. Yes. And during my my tenure there, at the very beginning of it, they introduced um, an actual pain certification because there is no pain specialty out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's anesthesiology and they're very good at acute pain but uh, there's no real specialty dedicated to chronic pain, um, but they're working that way. I mean, there's like sports medicine and rehab and, and so forth, but um, they're, they're more like, you know, recovery and get you back on the road as opposed to pain management. Yes. All right, so now tell me the difference between acute and chronic, because you've said that now a few times. Okay, so acute pain is what you think it is. You know, it's it's like you step on something and get a cut on your foot, that hurts, it hurts right now, you get a fracture, it hurts. Um, acute pain is what we call adaptive pain. You are adapting to the situation where wherein your body is telling you, you know, ow, don't use that, it hurts, it's damaged, okay? Chronic pain is what we call maladaptive. So there's no real reason to have chronic pain like arthritis. It doesn't help you in any way. You still need to walk. You still need to, if you're an animal, run and defend yourself and, and find food and posture properly so you can urinate and defecate. Um, and, it, and as a matter of fact, the less you use arthritic joints, the worse they get. 
So that's why it's, we, we are really in the veterinary world, we're starting to call it maladaptive instead of chronic, um, just because it serves no purpose. Um, except to make our lives miserable. <laughs> right. Now, I was just thinking about like the Arthritis Foundation for Humans and their motto is like, keep on moving. Basically. Right, right. And uh, I think I guess we, we don't have an equivalent study in, in, in veterinary medicine, but in human medicine, they found that um, an hour, they looked at people with knee, knee osteoarthritis and they looked at um, those people that went and walked Five, at least five days a week for an hour, yeah. it was like taking um, ibuprofen. Interesting. Just because yeah. the natural anti-inflammatory circulating around, juices flowing. Right. You get the, the joint fluid moving around. It brings oxygen to the tissue. Um, the body tries to heal it. You know, the body tries to bring in anti-inflammatories. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I want to talk about something that I find very interesting and we'll get into drugs in a little bit, but um, what I find interesting with chronic pain, something happens with like hypersensitivity and and feeling pain somewhere else. And do you know where I'm going with this? Yes. So, you know, I mean, you know, chronic pain does a number on our bodies in a, in a variety of different ways. Even just protecting a painful joint means you're going to have to put more stress on other joints more stress on muscles. You can develop secondary issues like uh, myofascial pain syndrome. Yeah. Um, and um, you can also get what they call wind up pain, this mm. constant barrage of these pain signalers. And, and I don't wanna throw out a bunch of big words, but they're called nociceptors. And uh, it, it's basically from Latin to, to feel pain. And these nociceptors say, send signals to the spinal cord and the spinal cord actually starts to change and it becomes more sensitive to the pain. And it actually start it can, in many instances, recruit nerves that don't normally um, uh, signal pain to, they, they, they get them on their side. So suddenly things like a light touch can start to hurt. Right. So I think I see that a lot in hospice. And, and even when I'm euthanizing pets, like families will say, you know, now just petting them, they're starting to flinch, they hurt, or they're even becoming, yeah. you know, anticipatory of that pain happening just, yeah. just from petting. Right. And so it's, it's much more profound with acute pain syndromes. You know, I learned this when I was in a, a freshman in college before I knew any of this. But I had, um, I was going to a community college and um, someone had just smashed into my car. I didn't have a car. I got dropped off at school and I reached in my pocket to get something and drove the lead of a finger uh, pencil up underneath my fingernail and it snapped off. And I could not get a ride back for six hours. Um, obviously my finger really hurt. At the end of six hours, you couldn't touch my elbow without me screaming. And, you know, that wind up pain uh, just can occur so quickly. And it's, yeah. it's often, you know, and maybe I'm going to digress a little bit, but, you know, when animals have surgery, if the, the pain is, is not treated properly at the time of the surgery, um, this can happen to your pet and, and the changes can be permanent. Interesting. So that's why, I mean, pain management is so vital when we're doing surgery and I sometimes don't, I don't like, you know, every surgery I did, they were getting pain management regardless. And there are some that will say, well, you know, do you want to add that or not as like an add on thing? Like to me, it's give it. <laughs> right. What, what's, it can't hurt. Right. Right. And, you know, part of this is, is our education and part of it is just the whole, the, the culture of maybe the veterinary clinic that someone practices in and so forth. Mm -hmm. But as, as veterinarians, we were taught to be so paranoid about bacterial infections. And, you know, even if it's suspicion, you know, we sometimes will put them on antibiotics for seven or 10 days. But yet so many veterinarians will do a painful procedure and then wring their hands and say, do they need three days worth, four days worth, five days worth? I mean, these are very innocuous drugs like NSAIDs. I mean, they're, they're very safe and there's no reason not to over treat one of those things. You're so right about that. Oh my gosh. I remember I had my gallbladder removed like 10 years ago 
Yeah. And it was tiny, teensy, weensy little incision. Yeah. I thought I was just going to lose it. And yeah. I had to have a beach towel underneath to like lift me up. Cause just the, you know, using my wimpy abs just to get up where yeah. ever since then I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody's getting really good meds. <laughs> yeah, I know it. Well, well, after, it. after my fingernail incident, I thought, oh, I would never stand up under torture. I'd be like, you know what? Don't even start. I'm going to tell you everything you want to know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now I've got a couple of questions here, by the way, we've got everybody from Oregon to Jacksonville, New Jersey. Um, so, uh, Laura asks from Georgia, when is pain a sign of a medical emergency such that they need to take their dog to the ER? What symptoms should they look for? So, you know, chronic pain is not a medical emergency. It's usually the result of something that's built up over the years. And if you decide one day that your dog is limping more than others, that's not an emergency. But if your dog, if there's an obvious injury or your dog is vocalizing or is having trouble moving, um, if, if you actually see a sudden impedance in the way your dog normally acts, that, that's an emergency. And, uh, you know, there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to go in and, and at least get an injection of something like, you know, hydromorphone and then and an NSAID or something like that to try to get it under control. Again, going back to the, the fingernail injury, the sooner you treat that, the better it is down the road. If you can get in front of pain, it is just way better than trying to chase it. So That's, that is, yes. You're <laughs> you the one that, okay. So I always say this, like it's, it's easier to keep it away than chase it away. Right. And I must have heard you say that because that is when I was stalking you and all of my stuff. <laughs> and I heard that I'm like, oh my gosh. And, and I, I, I get migraines really bad. And I know even the slightest little headache that's coming on, I go get my drugs because right. I know that like if it, if another two hours, it's going to be way harder to get rid of it. Yeah. And, and you know what? And so this, this whole thing of, you know, the, the you know, suffer through the pain, it will make you stronger. It doesn't, it makes you weaker. It makes you weaker. And, 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 and pain actually is close, pain receptors are closely associated with immune receptors. So if you're in chronic pain, you're actually more likely to get um, illnesses and so forth. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's all tied in. Mm -hmm. Now, um, to, this is a good, a lot of people say, well, I want them to have a little bit of pain so that way they don't use the bad hip or the bad joint after, let's say, surgery or something like that. Yeah. So then they didn't do a good job on their surgery and they're worried about it. That's my thing. <laughs> um, you know, because if you fix a leg, you fix the leg. Now, you know, it's not to say that you should go out and throw the Frisbee if they just had a bone plate put in their femur. But, you know, and, and maybe they're the kind of dog that's going to take off after a squirrel. But that is what like a leash is for. That is what, you know, managing the, the dog is for, not letting him hurt so he won't do those things. Perfect. There was actually a case in, um, of a veterinarian that, um, and this is a long time ago, but he, he refused to give pain medication after an orthopedic procedure and he ended up losing his license for it. Um, you know, so, I mean, there's every reason to keep a dog as pain-free as possible. And we've had the advent of these new drugs like Noceta, which is a three-day three day long bupivacaine, which is a local anesthetic. And so you inject it into the surgical area and it totally numbs it for three days. And That's so cool. Yeah, it is cool. And um, that was when I was practicing. <laughs> right, right. Um, it comes with a cost, but it's worth it. And you know what? I It's funny since when I do surgeries and I... I feel like this is a pain, like I'm doing some kind of orthopedic procedure. I'm going to have a little trouble controlling this pain. I've never in the years that this has been out had a person not agree for the several hundred dollars that the medication costs. I mean, right. everyone understands this. A lot of people have either had surgery or they know someone that's had surgery. And if you can say, I can cut out 100% of the pain with right. this injection, it's like, do it. Right. Because pain, like you said, it, it can it can um, slow healing. It right. could right. They may not want to eat, which is so important to to get the calories right. going. They might be whining all night and crying. Nobody's right. getting sleep then, and then we get nervous. So why not, if we can, right. do it? 
Now I've got Melanie asks a great question. Is constant licking a sign of pain? It certainly can be. Um, <laughs> and sometimes they're licking where it doesn't hurt. So it can be very confusing. Mm -hmm. So we have licking for psychological reasons. Um, there's something called a dog will lick themselves to excess. Um, it seems to be particularly prominent in Dobermans and Shepherds. And they will lick one spot until they develop something called the lick granuloma. That is um, between their ears that's making them do that. Usually, if they're I've had fighting. Dobermans. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That I've had. Um, yeah. Right. But um, I have seen animals like lick their front leg. And if you do an exam, you know, lo and behold, there is some arthritis in the, the wrist. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you treat it, it can go away. Mm hmm. But there could be dermatologic, dermatological reasons too. Right. Yeah. And, and, I know. And, and all of us has probably had that thing where you've got this itch and you can't quite find it. You know, it's on your back and you're like, have to circle in and the dog, so dogs can feel that as well too. Right. Yes. All right. I got a cool question coming from Linda. Can you talk, and you may not know this, but I have a feeling you may. Can you talk about red or near infrared light? as pain management. Okay, so there's a lot of new cool stuff coming out and it really hasn't been, it, it's not to the point where we know a lot about it. I don't know anything about the near infrared light, but I know that there are a lot of discoveries being made by LED lights. Not the kind that you see for sale at 1 a.m. in the morning when you can't sleep, but there, there are some LED lights, depending on the wavelength and so forth, that can help. Yeah. So infrared, it's probably heat or near infrared. It's probably heat that's helping. Mm. Okay. Now, since we're on light talk, what about lasers? Because I'm a fan of lasers. Yeah, lasers are great. And, um, you know, we have one. Um, for some of the pain conditions that we treat, it would be hard to manage them if we did not have a laser. Yeah, I Adore lasers. So. And all day, all lasers are not created equally. So. <laughs> they are nice. No, they're not. Here's a, here's a great question from Gary. How safe is carprofen when used daily on arthritic dogs? Okay, that's an interesting question. And it's interesting because there's confusion among veterinarians as well. So here's the scoop. Um, Carprofen, which is the generic of Remedil, it's kind of like the McDonald's slogan, billions served, okay? So we have more data on that drug than we do any other pain drug that we have. And I'll talk about the scary stuff first. There's about a one in, it's something between 10 and 20,000 chance that your dog could have an adverse reaction to it and it could cause um, a liver or a kidney issue. These are incredibly rare, and usually you get warning signs about it. Um, there is with any NSAID, whether it's carprofen or you know meloxicam or any of these other ones, there's always the potential for uh, a, um, an ulcer to form, just like us. Taking aspirin or ibuprofen, one day you've got an ulcer, and it can happen. The, the hard part is that, um, you know, the dog isn't going to tell you it hurts directly, but, you know, so I always tell my clients when they're on this medication, um, if the dog quits eating and it's out of the ordinary and it's not because, you know, a grandkid's been chasing the dog around all day or something like that, right. um, that, you know, stop and ask your veterinarian. So um, there's many part and parts of this answer. So, so in my practice, what I do is we put them on an NSAID like Remedil, and we, um, uh, first of all, we, we draw blood before we start, make sure everything looks okay. There's no severe kidney disease or something like that that would contraindicate the use of any NSAID. And then we put them on the, the NSAID, and then two weeks later, two to three weeks later, we recheck the blood. If everything's good, that dog's good. I mean, you're not going to really have to worry about it, except the possibility of an ulcer, which can happen on the 10th dose, it can happen on the thousandth dose, or it can happen never. So in an effort to try to make it safer, a lot of veterinarians try to reduce the dosage 
or reduce the frequency. Um, but uh, there is a, a veterinarian I admire greatly, Paulo Stegal. He's from Brazil. He practices, he teaches in Canada right now. He did a paper uh, with some other people and it showed that if you try to do pulse therapy, um, like only give it on bad days or only give it other, every other day, or you try to give half the dose, that the risk of issues from an NSAID are just as bad as if you give it per label directions. Mm -hmm. So always follow label directions, that way you get the benefit. Um, if you give less than label directions, you have all the risk and maybe none of the benefit. None of the benefit, that's so cool. Now, uh, long answer. Long answer. Sorry. No. Yeah. This is a, this is a good one. Um, so, uh, what about multimodal approach? Big fancy, not big fancy. Medium yeah. fancy word, but yeah. important. Yeah, it is important because I. So part of my practice, I have a general practice. I see dogs for you know coughing and diarrhea and ear infections and all that stuff. But I a lot of my practice is pain management, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of them people. Um, you know, come to me because they haven't gotten satisfaction elsewhere, or they've been referred to me when other veterinarians realize it's it's too big of a problem. And often I hear out of their mouth, these NSAIDs don't work. Medicam doesn't work, Rimadil doesn't work, whatever. And, and, and oftentimes it's because it's been used as a standalone product. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these products only have about a 50% efficacy rate. So in other words, it, it helps in about half the cases. But if you can do something else, you can boost the way that works. If a dog is, so multimodal just doesn't mean multi-pharmacy. You know, there are other drugs, things like amantadine and gabapentin, uh, amitriptyline and so forth that can all be given. But it is also things like weight loss is part of uh, multimodal. 10% weight loss in an obese dog is the equivalent of giving an NSAID. Uh, wait, yes. wait. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And, and this, so, most so many dogs are overweight and, and right. people don't, I think we're sort of immune to how big our dogs are. And my Doberman, I had him like lean machine and people would come up to me and say, he's too skinny. And I'm like, no, he's not. Like, yeah, he's perfect. right. But but again, weight the loss is right. Weight loss is important. Again, malt, part of multimodal is exercise. Part yep. of multimodal, you know, it, it, it may mean, um, you know, using ramps and stuff like that. So your dog's not hurting itself and jump downs, you know, right. uh, that's a big source of injury, jump down injuries. My, yeah. I'm guilty. My own dog got a jump down injury uh, because we, she liked to sit on the counter and watch people come in the front door and, uh, then she would jump down and eventually she got a fracture in her, her elbow, you know? Ah, no, I know. I see that so much. Or like the end of the stairs, they're just like, and, and then, then they don't have then super dog. Yeah. yeah. I'm always yeah. like, yeah, there are, my entire <laughs> house is covered in bath mats and yoga mats for my old girl, Sam, who's 14. Yeah. And like that, I, as we get to go to homes, you know, Dr. Mike and it, lap of love, I see so many dogs just ice skating around their house and i'm like all we got to do is put some bath mats and yoga mats and it's like a life changer to have it is that. yep it's crazy and that's a part of the multimodal now you've like outfitted your whole clinic to this yeah so we put we put in rubber flooring in our clinic so um which is it's it smelled a little bit like a tire store for the first <laughs> month because it is really <laughs> recycled tires <laughs> but um it's you know it's sanitary it's safe and we have slate up front, which is fairly good for walking on, not perfect. But you can see the dogs kind of like, they're eyeballing that rubber. They can't wait to make that 10 foot pass to get to the rubber floor. Right. And uh, they love it. And it's so uh, yeah, it's crazy. Now, I've got to ask you something because about three people have asked it. Okay. Could be a little sensitive. Okay. All right. CBD oil. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're not buying it at the video store, you know. Um, you know <laughs> okay, so what are your thoughts? So, um, full, full disclosure, I'm on the advisory board of a CBD company. All right. Okay. And, but it wasn't, I, it wasn't because they asked me, it was because I wanted to, because I could see all the good they were doing. Yeah. They, they, and the name of the company is called Elevet. 
Mm -hmm. And they um, actually um, have, they, they did a study with Cornell University on arthritic dogs and proved that their product works. More importantly, what I really liked about them is they, they use their own labs and independent labs to test for things like toxins, pesticides, heavy metals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it, it really works, but you got to use the right product. Yes. I'm going to put in our, um, in our chat here, because it's Elevet, and I want to make sure that everybody's got that. Uh, and right. you can buy it directly. And unlike right. a lot of companies, a lot of companies are really afraid of the, um, I don't know, the FDA, the DEA, whatever, about recommending doses. Elevet will tell you. I mean, it's on the package. It tells you exactly how much. Um, they also have a, a new product out called Calm and Something. It's a chew. So you can oh. use it for like visits to the vet to the if there's thunderstorms like uh, or other noise phobias and it That's works it really works but your dog's I, your dog's sleepy I, I and there's a lot of people on this on this that are watching this too that that have cognitive issues with their dogs and so i think right. it's massively helpful and i listen back in the day when we could go out um and i would go to just like the 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 not the market but like the uh the fair not the like the food, the weekend tents, all the tents yeah. out. And there'd yeah. be like CBD oil. It's like a pyramid scheme, basically, right. to, to right. sell it. And I'm like, I am not going to. Get that right. There. And it's very complicated. I mean, it turns out it's not, not only the amount of CBD, CBD, but there's also something called CBDA. And then there's these other things called terpenes that are in there. And terpenes are what gives um, CBD the, the, um, weird grassy smell to it. Mm. Um, but uh, all those things seem to work um, together. You know, they, they have this cohort effect where, yeah. and if you have someone just doing plain CBD, you're just, you know, th just throw your money away, you know, don't, yeah. don't do it. I'm not well, saying can... that they're the only company in the world, but the one that I've most researched and they're, I'm really happy with them. Now that's that. And that's why I was a little bit like, it could be sensitive, but that's, that's the one that I would recommend too. Now, yeah. I will be, uh, it would be, it would be horrible if I didn't mention one of the best books out there. <laughs> and that would be your book. Let me make sure I get in the camera right. You got it. I don't need to be in the picture. So this book is for you guys, for, for pet owners on pain relief for dogs. What I love as a veterinarian, I learned so much about it. Just evaluating pain, signs of pain, because I, I always say like dogs and cats just don't know the benefit of complaining, right? Like I complain about a hangnail so I can get out of making dinner. They're like, right. <laughs> what's, what's the point of complaining? Now, one of my dogs complains a lot, but, but it was really cool to read in this book about the little things like the way your dog gets up. And normally a dog would get up with their hind end first, their booty up, right. and then their front end. But if you've got a dog with hip problems, they're gonna get up with the front first and then like kind of use that as the as the crutch. Dra drag their drag their back ends up. Drag yeah. the back end, yes. So I this book is uh is for sale on Amazon. Yes. <laughs> and I think it should be a bestseller because I and I recommend it all the time to veterinarians and pet owners. So if you've got any questions about pain relief, definitely please. And we just put it in the in the chat also where to get the book. Now, Dr. Petty, are we going to come up with one one day for cats? <laughs> yeah, you know, I would really like to. Um, <laughs> the um, and I would really like to get Sheila to co-write it with me. So, okay, <laughs> Sheila, I am sure is watching this, by the way. And if and Dr. Sheila was on maybe two months ago talking about anesthesia and risks in geriatric pets. So everybody loves her. And the two of you guys would make the best book. Yeah. And I think it would be amazing. But it is it that this book talks about uh, what I love is, you know, amantatine, gabapentin, all these, all these drugs that, that pets are on. You even talk about like elk 
slippery elm or something or like right, elm, right, right. <laughs> all that good stuff that people are asking me questions about. And um, and so I recommend, I mean, this one's my old one. It's so dirty. I actually have clean ones because I, I like give them out at some of my lectures because veterinarians and pet owners are like should have this. Yeah. Now, I know yeah, you- it, it, if I can interrupt for a second, too, it's yeah. kind of interesting. I really wrote this for the pet owner, but I would say most of the books have been bought by veterinarians, people that want to break into pain management. In fact, there's one drug company that bought a thousand of these books and gave them away. That, yeah. right you know i i bought like 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 50 and i give them I, you know I, we oh and you did okay so we have a textbook it's more for veterinarians so yes. it's, a little, it's a little too deep like but you and sheila wrote the chapter on pain in our book it's such a pleasure to work with oh my god who <laughs> plus, she, sheila, sheila is sheila plus she always wants to do all the heavy lifting so that makes it easy for me okay <laughs> totally now listen, I know you've got like pets and and critters to take care of. And we could not have uh, I could not appreciate more you coming on. And there's there's a couple other questions out there and I really just want everybody to to probably to 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 grab your book cuz I think that's going to that's going to answer 98% of the questions that are coming in. And you know, is there is there a place for somebody if they're in some other parts of the country? Because if they're outside, if they're suburban Detroit, they need to come see you. But is there a place like that veterinarians that uh, that are part of the certification program? Like if somebody wants to go find somebody who's like specialized or, or can, is a guru like you? Yeah. So so there's two places that you okay. can go. You can go to IVAPM.org. VAPM.org. I'm going to put it in the thing. And, and they have um, a list of their members, but they also have a list of people that have gone through the certification program. Okay, perfect. There is another place called curacore.org. That's C -U -R -A -Core, C -U -R -E, tough. C-U-R-A core, C-O-R-E dot org. Yep. And um, this is a, a, a medical acupuncture website and they have both a human and a veterinary side. If you if you go to the veterinary part and say find a practitioner, then you can find someone that does acupuncture. Anyone that knows how to do acupuncture is tuned into pain. Yeah, I love it. I love me. I love acupuncture. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I was about to say I love me some acupuncture. Yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing I'm seeing a question I really want to answer. Okay, go for it. And uh, about her dog stressing out for hydrotherapy and laser when she so she had to stop. It's some, there are some dogs that just are not meant for it, um, especially getting into hydrotherapy. Um, I, I don't, you know, so I've got this huge pain practice. I don't even have an underwater treadmill. Mm -hmm. There's like twice a year that I wish I did, but I can do pretty much everything else that I, I need to without it. Um, but, you know, talk about the anxiety and talk about things like the Elevet you know, calm and comfortable or whatever it's called, or the, um, there's other drugs that are anti-anxiety drugs. You don't want to give a tranquilizer. A tranquilizer is just a straight jacket and will make your dog suffer through it without being able to say anything. So you want to get um, something that is anti-anxiety. Trazodone is my favorite because it's so safe and dogs, and you can even give it to cats. And um, I often find that when dogs have to come in for a rehab or laser or something, they're very anxious. They get it the first two or three visits and they're like, hey, I don't care anymore. I've, I've worked through it and I'm okay. If the dog doesn't have a heart condition, one that works even better is a drug called Saleo. It's a, a, a yeah. gel that was designed for uh, noise phobias, but we find it works for dogs that like are, are so scared about car rides, they vomit and stuff like that. that mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's stuff out there. Good. Yeah. Now I, now I see that popped up. I, you got, you got it more real time than I do. <laughs> the questions popping up. Um, did I forget anything super important that I should have asked you? Um, yes. If you are not happy with the veterinarian that you have, that is, you know, blowing off your concerns or requests, get a new one, uh, find someone else. And, um, you know, it can be a learning experience for everyone. Um, it doesn't mean that they're a bad veterinarian, but it me might mean it's just, it's not their thing. You know, right. I mean, I have skin issues that I become, you know, confounded by very quickly 
And it's not to say I'm a terrible veterinarian. It's just like, you know, as veterinarians, we're everything to you. You know, we're surgeons, we're oncologists, we're dermatologists, we're dentists, we're everything. And you can't be good at everything. You so it doesn't mean that your vet is bad for that. It just might, for everything, it just means that maybe pain's not his thing. Or her thing. Like, right, some are great at dentistry and I was like horrible at that yeah. and, and things like that. And, you know, lap of love, we do focus on end of life. And so that's, you know, what, what we do. And, and, and we appreciate at lap of love, all your support because you yeah. are a big support. Lap, lap of love is so wonderful. We, you know, um, in the, in my veterinary clinic, one of the most stressful things for us was to put an animal down. And, um, we, after using lap of love for a couple of months, we just quit ordering our euthanasia solution. And we sent them all the lap of love because they just do such a great job. Oh, well, we appreciate it. And, I'm still, you know what? I can't wait for conferences to open up again so I could do more stalking. Yes. <laughs> and listen to you talk. And we're going to get on Sheila and you guys to write a cat book because I think it's needed for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for everybody who's listening. And I hope this was helpful. And Dr. Petty, thank you again. We oh, you're welcome. So much. It was so a pleasure. Much. We'll do it again right. sometime. For sure. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.